The Shadow of a Doubt by Edith Wharton, adapted for radio by Melissa Murray and introduced by Laura Rattray, reader in American literature at the University of Glasgow. It is little known that at the start of her career, Edith Wharton, who would become one of America's most renowned authors, was as, if not more interested, in becoming a playwright than a novelist. At the turn of the 20th century, before she ever published a novel, Wharton penned a series of plays, often social comedies of the upper classes, though at times moving down the social scale to focus on those workers who made possible those leisured, privileged lives. Today, these plays are either lost or survive only in fragments, providing glimpses of a frustrated playwriting career. I'm Laura Rattray, reader in American literature at the University of Glasgow. And in autumn 2016, Professor Mary Chinnery and I came across an obscure 1901 newspaper reference to a Wharton play that nobody seemed to have heard of, The Shadow of a Doubt. Intrigued, we decided to look for it, scouring catalogues, inventories, theatre magazines, production listings in the US, the UK and in France. And there it was, in a play scripts and prompt books collection in a Texas archive. We finally had a complete original play by Edith Wharton. Reading the script, we were immediately struck by the way it anticipated familiar hallmarks of Wharton's novels. The signature witty one-liners, a society setting, wonderfully drawn portraits of women condemned to operate within the social and economic constraints of their time. But listeners may also be surprised by its English setting. Wharton was a great europhile, and the edginess of its plot, which pivots on the theme of assisted suicide. The final act foreshadows the closing stages of the House of Mirth, while Wharton would recycle a major plot line for her 1907 novel, The Fruit of the Tree. Newspaper coverage of the time reveals that The Shadow of a Doubt was taken on by leading theatre impresario Charles Froman, with Elsie de Wolf to play the leading role in New York. Yet for reasons still unknown, possibly its controversial topic, The production didn't quite make it. The New York Times reporting in March 1901 that the play had been abandoned for the present. In The Age of Innocence, outsider Eleanor Lenska observes that life in America is like being on stage before a dreadfully polite audience that never applauds. Wharton never had her audience for the shadow of a doubt. Tonight, 117 years later, We are that audience for Wharton's only surviving complete original play and for Edith Wharton as playwright. The Shadow of a Doubt by Edith Wharton Adapted for radio by Melissa Murray I'm afraid Park Lane is rather a tame outlook for a traveller so lately returned from abroad. I was just watching for the broom. Mama has never had a carriage before, you know. Hmm. She said I was to be sure and tell her when I saw any signs of it. She told me once that she used to envy the girls who could always afford to take a bus when she was in at the hospital. She always had to walk then. Sylvia, dear, is it quite necessary that you should call Mrs Derwent Mama? I don't know. I suppose not. She told me to call her Kate, but Father likes me to call her Mama. Well, you must do what your father wishes. Do you still think of your mother sometimes, Sylvia? Oh, Grandfather, of course I do. You'll never forget her, shall you? Forget her? Why? How could I? It's only two years ago. And besides, Kate talks to me about her every day. Indeed. And what does she say? Just what you do, Grandfather. All about how good and kind she was, and how I must never, never, never forget her. The broom is here. Yeah. And it's, it's Kate, dear, you did say. 
I'm going to run out and pay a few visits before John comes back. He told me he should leave the foreign office earlier than usual this afternoon, so I... Well, I, I shan't be long. The carriage is at the door, madam. Thank you. A gentleman called to see you a few minutes ago, madam, but I said you were just going out. A gentleman? To see me? Oh, uh, it must have been a mistake. I think not, madam. It was Mr. Mazaret, and he said he'd call again later, and he wished most particular to see you and Mr. Derwent, madam. Mazaret? I thought he was still in South Africa. He's walking in the park with cousin Clodagh at this very moment. They met on the steps. I saw them just as I saw the carriage. I saw them walking over. Mr. Mazaret. Of course. Ah, of course. That's stupid of me. I'm not used to visitors. But I um, I must be gone now. Is there anything I can do for you, Lord Ossoli? Thank you, no. I shall stay at home and nurse my gout, and this great girl shall entertain me with an account of her travels. Have you shown your grandfather your photographs? Oh, no! She was so immensely interested in all we saw abroad. I'm so glad I persuaded John to take her with us. Don't you uh, think her improved since last year, Lord Ossoli? Isn't she growing pretty? She seems so to me. So so like her mother, don't you think so? I think the brougham is here. Oh, how, how thoughtless of me to keep it waiting. I'm not used to a carriage yet, you see, Lord Ossoli. I, I won't be long, dear. Here is my album. <laughs> see how beautifully they're arranged? Yes. Kate gummed them all in for me. Wonderful. I couldn't have done it all half as well myself. <laughs> oh, Vienna. I was secretary of the embassy there, long before you were born. Your father might have been an ambassador there, or anywhere, if circumstances had been different, if your poor mother had lived. She was so fitted, so wonderfully fitted to help him on in his career. Kate is trying so hard to help Father too. She studied French and German all last winter on purpose. Hmm. Well, you seem to have had a very happy year with your your new mother and your father. Was he always happy? What I mean is, was he... Lady Usk, my lord. Ah, my dear Susan, what a pleasant interruption. I'd no idea you were in town. I've come up for the day to call on the bride. Of course, of course. And here is Sylvia waiting to be noticed. Why, you great girl, how tall you've grown. <laughs> how glad your grandfather must be to have you back. He is, I think. Thank you. And now send her away, please, or I shall be sure to say something improper. Children always affect me in that way. They stare so that they embarrass me and then I blurt out the wrong thing. And now, dear, I think you'd better carry your photographs back to the schoolroom. We will look at them another time. Very well, Grandfather. Another time. Goodbye, Lady Usk. Goodbye, child. How pretty she grows. So like Agnes, only more animation. You speak as if Agnes had been cold. Come and sit by the fire. You find all this very trying? Oh, intolerable. It brings back all I suffered at Agnes's death. Miss Tredenis, as she was then, was so associated with the... Agnes was a perfect daughter. I can never reconcile myself to her having died with no one near her, except the present Mrs. Derwent. I understand she behaved admirably. Admirably. I try to remember that. A sister could not have been more devoted, more heroic. The very last time I saw Sir Hector Blair, last winter it was, just a few days before his own death, he told me that in all his professional experience he had never seen a more skilful and intelligent nurse than Miss Trendenis. Ah, oh, poor dear Sir Hector. What a loss he was. I've never dared to be really ill since he died. But tell me. Is Miss Tredenis and uh, Mrs. Derwent so perfectly awful? Awful? No, much worse than that. She's so perfectly irreproachable, so damnably considerate and well-bred and tactful and self-effacing. I, I can hardly bear to stay in the same room with her. And she always makes me behave like a cad. <laughs> I sometimes think she does it on purpose. She's kind to Sylvia. Insufferably. And John's in love with her? Disgusting. <laughs> well... 
What can you expect when a man marries against the advice of all his friends? Ah, Susan, I've no doubt it seems a capital joke to you, but to me... <laughs> To see my Agnes, my darling, thrust aside, superseded, utterly forgotten within two years of her death. To see her husband, the man I had raised from obscurity for her sake, whose career I had watched over as if he'd been my own son. To see him within a year. Put into my daughter's place an upstart, a nobody. Oh, was Miss Trudenis as bad as that? Well, she was a clergyman's daughter, I believe. A clergyman's daughter? Mm. Good heavens, how imprudent. <laughs> <laughs> I don't wonder you fear the worst. A lot of seedy relations, too, I suppose. We haven't been troubled by them, yet. I always thought John had a career before him. In fact, it was his immense promise, the power I felt in him, that reconciled me to Agnes's marrying him. At the time, I should have liked her to make a different choice, to see more of the world, at any rate, before giving the preference to a young fellow who had nothing to recommend him but his brains. But I ended by believing in him as much as she did. And after her death, the one thing that pulled me together and put a little heart in me was the thought of making him what she'd wanted him to be. John has lost his ambition. I don't know. I've seen nothing of him since this marriage. They've only been back a week. But in a career like his, the wife counts for so much. I'm not fundamentally opposed to second marriages... For Sylvia's sake alone, I would have accepted... If you could have chosen her. Now, if I could have seen him choose a woman of his first wife's rank and traditions. Why, this girl was a hospital nurse. A poor protégé of Agnes's who took her in out of charity. She's had no experience of the world, no education, no advantages. Her whole life has been one long struggle against poverty... You know me too well to fancy that I think the worse of her for that, but but it's hardly the training for a future cabinet minister's mm, wife. I'm not so sure. I've always fancied I might have made my mark if I'd been brought up in that way. But my whole life has been one long struggle against wealth. <laughs> <laughs> but no, no, I quite enter into your feelings. It was John Derwent's duty either to marry the woman you wished or else someone perfectly impossible. A barmaid, what? for choice. Kind of lady who could be got rid of for a few hundred pounds without getting into the papers. Susan. <laughs> You're a very ambitious man. And as you've always been too rich, too lazy, too good-looking... No. Yes, yes, I said good-looking to cultivate your ambitions on your own account, you transfer them to poor Agnes and her husband. You meant to make John a great man for Agnes's sake. When Agnes died, you hoped he'd marry Clodagh Neville. Because she is your niece, and you wanted to keep his greatness in the family. Mm. And now an interloper has robbed you of it, and of him. And I call it very hard on you. I do. There's some truth in what you say. But the slight to Agnes is what I feel. Such a horrible death. Two hours after they had parted at the station, he was on his way to London, you remember? She was carried home from the hunting field with a broken back. How could he forget so soon? The other memories are not so short. Did I tell you I'd met Basil Mount the other day? John's old friend? Yes. He often used to stop with them down at Winterby and had left there the very day before the accident happened. Well, I met him at the club last week. I hadn't seen him since... since Agnes... And, you know, at the very first word, he choked and had to bolt out of the room... Well, my dear, you're not the only disappointed matchmaker in the world. If you wanted Clodagh, so did I. You? For whom? My dear nephew, Bobby Maseret. Not going to be a cabinet minister like John Derwent, but lots of nice girls would be glad to have him all the same, and here he is, wasting his time over the only one who won't look at him, your Clodagh. So I wasn't altogether sorry to hear of your son-in-law's marriage. 
Derwent is the kind of man that women always take seriously. If he goes for a walk in the rain, they think he's doing something mm. heroic. Mm. <laughs> Whereas a boy like Bobby can get himself shot half to pieces in South Africa and... He's shot? By Joe. Not really. He told me he tried everything else with her. Bankruptcy, incipient consumption, and flirting with a married woman. Badly wounded? Nothing so commonplace. <laughs> I was going to say that he'd come back without actually having been under fire, which is an achievement in itself. I wonder that Clodagh can resist him. Mm, but she does, though. The ungrateful girl. I think the two of them are just now taking a turn in the park. You must have heard that Clodagh was coming to call on the bride and waylaid her. He's in the state where nothing cures a man but marriage. <laughs> and that almost always does. Susan, you have no heart. Yes, my dear, I have. And though you've doubtless forgotten the fact, it was once very much at your disposal. But at that time, you didn't believe in second marriage, even with a nice girl who was not a clergyman's daughter. I must be off now. Oh, well, one more turn, surely. She must be back. I see the carriage. No, I don't. <laughs> because you are assiduously looking in the wrong direction. <laughs> and, of course, that's unforgivable, being assiduous. You seem very keen to see her. Uh, just as I am, of course. I want to get to know her for my uncle Lord Osterley's sake. And John's. I thought you knew her already. Walk with me. <sighs> Mr Mazaret, you're so sensible when you're not silly. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> I know how odd you will think it that I should speak in this way of a friend. For Kate is my friend. I've always liked her immensely. Always believed she was the woman to make John happy. Indeed, it was I who persuaded my uncle not to oppose the marriage. But now that the thing is done... Yes? Well, there's a change somehow. She's not the same frank, straightforward girl I used to know. If she had a fault then, it was that of being too brusque, too positive, too careless of other people's opinion... And now she gives me the impression of trying to conciliate everybody. Well, you must admit that her position's a difficult one. Why should it be? We all like her. And my uncle has been very kind. No doubt. But all the same, poor Mrs Derwent is very much in the position of an insect under a microscope. You all agreed that she's a remarkably nice specimen, but that doesn't prevent your pulling her to pieces. <laughs> I think that is very unfair. I quite understand how you all feel about it. Lord Osterley can't help comparing her to his daughter, and you... Well, John was your friend long before you knew, Mr. Dennis, and it's natural that you should expect great things of his wife. I want the best for my cousin and for my friend. Let's go in now. Uh, just another half hour. Half a half hour, please. Will you talk nonsense? Not of that kind, I promise. <laughs> Miss Clodagh and Mr. Mazaret. Oh. We've interrupted. No, no, not at all, not in the least. We both just sat down, haven't we, John? Yeah. Oh, I should have asked the footman to bring more cups. No, oh, no, I'll have to ring for them. How extraordinary to ring for cups. He will know to bring them himself, my dear. Uh. How lovely to see you, Clodagh. <laughs> Hello, Bobby. I heard this morning you were back on leave and meant to look you up later at the club. Please, please. Don't you think Kate is looking well, Clodagh? Oh, Kate is wonderful. Uh, you look immensely well, the pair of you. Well, we had such a good year abroad, we'd have made it two if I could have had my leave extended. Oh, John, what would my uncle have said? I am quite as ambitious for him as Lord Osterley. Yes, she dragged me back from my first real holiday. Well, surely not your first. Oh, the holidays are like love affairs. The last is always the first. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, Lewis. And now that he's back... I mean to make him work. Uh, they're all in a conspiracy to make you into a great man. Mm. When all I ask is to be a happy one. <laughs> Don't they ever go together? <laughs> well, I've just seen a poor fellow who has reason to think they don't. Bobby, did you hear that 
Willoughby has had to resign? No, has he? Uh, Sir Gerald Willoughby, mm. your colleague at the Foreign Office, but I thought all his friends have been working so hard to get him appointed to Spain. He hasn't gone and married Mrs Carlton. He has, the unmitigated ass. But I thought you told me there was no truth in those stories about Mrs Castleton. I never thought there was. And I know Willoughby doesn't think so. He's not the man to marry a woman he doesn't believe in. Well, well then... With the world, you know, the question is not, is the story true, but is there a story? Believing in a person all by oneself must be as dreary as dining alone. No woman would speak in that way of a man she loved. Mm. Well, one can hardly call Willoughby's position an enviable one. He's had to chuck his career, for one thing. Though he's so much in love that I doubt if that counts with him at present. But why should he care if he knows it isn't true? It can't be pleasant for the most adoring husband to feel that there's even... The shadow of a doubt about his wife. No, I never mean to marry a woman I don't trust. And you always mean to trust the woman you marry? Even if circumstances... I should distrust circumstances and not her. And so should I, by joke. <laughs> How gallant they both are, to our faces. Mm. I must be going now, Kate, dear. Oh, no, already, mm. don't go, please. Oh, it's a long way to Palace Green. You'll let me see you home, of course. <laughs> no, don't spoil everything. Clodagh, let me ring for a cab for you. <laughs> you forget that I patronised the bus. <laughs> Well, then I'll walk to Piccadilly with you and put you on a bus. <laughs> Goodbye, dear. Give my love to Sylvia. Goodbye, Mr. Mazaret. Goodbye. We'll see each other soon, though, won't we? Goodbye. Um, can, I, can I get them to bring you something to eat? More tea? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm flustered. But you see, it's my first real taste of happiness. Can't imagine why I said that. My dear Mrs. Derwent. So ridiculously unused to being happy. It's like a ready-made gown that doesn't fit me. Well, some ready-made gowns are very becoming, I'm sure. Mr. Mazaret, do you think John's happy? Indecently so. What you said just now was dreadfully cruel. What I said? You and John. Why, we agreed we'd always believe in our wives... And really, for an unmarried man, that's pledging oneself to a lot. Yeah, but that was an afterthought. Your first impulse was to pity Sir Gerald Willoughby. Not many men marry a Mrs Castleton. I call that an exceptional case. Any woman may appear to be a Mrs Castleton, if she has enemies. My dear Mrs Derwent, a pretty woman needn't fear any enemies unless she's had two good friends. Uh, the, the women you know have been sheltered, protected, but there are others. Mrs. Derwent, you seem troubled. If there's anything troubled, I... Troubled? I... Oh, no, I was, I was only thinking of that poor woman. When you're in a bright, cosy room by a warm fire, do you never think of the poor wretches outside in the rain? I always shall, after this. Yes, do. Goodbye, Mrs. Derwent. Goodbye. And always feel free to call. You are John's friend, and I hope you will be mine. Yes, I will. I'll be finished soon. Dr Carruthers. Mrs Derwent. Ah, how do you do, Dr Carruthers? How dare you? How dare you? If only you'll take it quietly. Quietly? Yes. Not behave as if there were a mad dog in the room. It's like having a tooth out, you know. The quieter you keep, the sooner it's over. This house is Lord Austerlitz. Oh, I've visited it before. You know, the state drawing rooms are shown to the public on Tuesdays. Oh. Lady Agnes, dear Lady Agnes, once gave me a card. You have no right to be here. Oh, come. As good a right as you. Lord Ostley may come in at any moment. Well, I'm not afraid to meet him. Or anyone. Come, Miss Tr Mrs Derwent, I mean. <gasps> Let's discuss the question on a reasonable basis. I don't want to make myself any more obnoxious than I can help. I'm not a stage villain trying to... Frighten the heroine in order to give the hero a chance to rescue her. I'm simply a poor devil who's down on his luck. You know what I've been through. For the last two months, ever since the child died, my wife's been at the point of death. I haven't enough left to buy medicine for her. And we shall be turned into the street if I can't rake up 100 by the end of the week. I wrote this all to you. I, and I wrote to you. Saying I... that you hadn't the money. Yes. 
Here's your letter. I always keep your letters. But that excuse won't do, you know. Look at this house. Look at that gown you've got on. And I saw you just now in a smart carriage with two servants. What I have told you was true. I haven't five pounds in my purse. This house isn't mine. The carriage wasn't mine. The jewels are yours, though. My jewels? I saw you leaving this house the other evening. To dine out, I suppose. Your cloak was open. And you had a string of stones around your neck. Sapphires, I think. I, I will send you money as soon as I can, if you will go at once. I'm afraid that's rather too indefinite. I'll, I'll borrow Pawn, whatever people do, I will send you something. I promise you. Tomorrow's too far off when a man's starving, Mrs. Derwent. Yes, that's what I am. I... I haven't touched a mouthful for two days. My last shilling went this morning to buy my wife a bottle of milk. My God, can't you see I'm desperate? What do you mean to do? To wait here. Till you get me that necklace. No, I can't. Or till your husband comes in. Dr Carruthers, I cannot give you the necklace. My husband gave it to me when we were married. He expects me to wear it. He would question me. A woman can always find an answer. I cannot do it. I can wait. You don't dare. What have I to lose? No one will believe you. We'll see. You'll go instantly. Instantly. You'll leave me in peace. You won't come back. Not if they're as good stones as I think. All right, then. <laughs> Dr. Carruthers. <laughs> uh, uh, Mr. Derwent. I had no idea you were in London. Yes, um, I've been here for nearly a year now. Ah. You've given up your practice at Winterby, then? Uh, given up? Uh, yes. I hadn't heard of your leaving. I've not been down there since... since my wife, since Lady Agnes's death. In fact, I think the last time I saw you was... Yes. Uh, please, sit. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry you should have let me know you were in London. But the fact is, I've been abroad myself for the last year. You may have heard that I've married Miss Trudenis. Yes, I read of it in the papers. Yes. And having known Miss Trudenis at Winterby when she was at the time you speak of, mm. I ventured to call this afternoon and offer my good wishes on her marriage. I, I hope it was not a liberty, but Miss Trudenis was very kind to me when I was sent for at the time of uh, the accident. Mrs Derwent has often spoken to me of the... Skill and devotion you showed. She'll be very glad to see you, I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> You're practising here, I suppose. Uh, I had what seemed a good opening. Hmm. The opportunity of buying out a long-established practice at Hampstead. Ah. I came up from Winterby for that purpose. But unluckily I fell ill on first arriving. Typhoid fever. Oh. And I'd hardly recovered when my wife was confined. The child died, and she has been in a critical condition ever since. Oh, I'm, I'm so I sorry. I lost the chance of buying the practice that was offered me. And things have been going from bad to worse. I, I didn't mean to tell you this, Mr. Doan, but I... You saw what I was doing when you came in. Taking a cup of tea, I think. Having my first meal in two days. Good heavens. I, I'm sorry, I had no idea... My obligations to you give me the right to take this matter in hand at once. Personally, I can't offer you more than temporary assistance, but Lord Osterley is in a position to help you to a permanent opening. Possibly in one of the hospitals or something of the sort. You're more than kind. I, I hadn't hoped Lord to receive... Lord Osterley has, of course, heard of you from Mrs. Doe, and he will thank me for sending you to him. I'm writing a few lines which you can ask his secretary to transmit. Here. And now, if you'll accept a small sum in the meantime... John, I... How do you do, Mrs. Derwent? You're startled, dear. My wife inevitably associates you, as I do, with the saddest scene in our lives. How do you do, Dr. Carruthers? And I know you would be as glad as I am that he should come to us at a time when he himself is in 
need of help and sympathy. <laughs> Mr. Derwent has been more than kind. He found out that I'd been unlucky and has generously offered to help me. Uh, I'm a bad hand at expressing my gratitude, but I'll, I'll try to prove it. My dear man, there, there need be no such formalities between us. I, I should have been seriously annoyed if you hadn't let me know you were in trouble. And Lord Osterley will feel as I do. Be sure to give my note to his secretary. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Goodbye, Mrs. Durham. Uh, what note? I I've given Carruthers a line to Lord Osterley. He told me last week there was a vacancy on one of his medical boards. And you've recommended Dr. Carruthers? I simply called my father-in-law's attention to the fact that Carruthers, a man we all respect, is looking out for something to do. Well, you know how many people go to him for help. I don't think we ought to add to that number. I hope this will be the beginning of better things for you. You must give back that letter. I, I beg your pardon? Kate. Will you please return that letter to my husband? Really? I... I hardly understand. Kate, you are putting me in a very awkward position. <laughs> but since you have gone so far, you, you must explain yourself. Dr Carruthers does not require any explanation. He knows my reason. Do you? Yes. It is that I know too much of Mrs Derwent. What? What are you saying? No, no. Not another word. Mrs. Derwent's wish is sufficient. Give me that letter back. No, by God, I won't. I didn't ask you for the letter. Or for anything else. It was your own idea to give it to me. If Mrs. Derwent won't explain, I will. She doesn't want me to present this letter to Lord Osterley because she's afraid I'll talk. Please go now. I'll talk about what happened at Winterby. No. At Winterby? At the time of Lady Agnes's death. No. Explain yourself. It's simple enough. Mrs. Derwent doesn't want that little matter of the chloroform to get out. John, uh, chloroform? Yes, to, to quiet the pain. To make an end. That's what she said. John! Go on. She came to me after Sir Hector left and asked if Lady Agnes was likely to suffer much. I said she probably would suffer horribly. Then we must put an end to it, she said. Go on. And so she told me to wait till the maid had gone downstairs for her tea. And then to bring the chloroform to Lady Agnes's room. I did as she told me. And half an hour later she called me again. And? And by that time, Lady Agnes was dead. Please. God. Speak, Kate. You must have some answer to this infamous lie. It is not a lie. I did give Agnes chloroform. When Sir Hector Blair told me that her back was broken and that there was no hope, I determined not to let her suffer. I've nursed such cases in hospital... She was very strong, and her agony would have been awful. I spared her that, and I am not sorry. Will you send this man away? One moment, please, one moment. <laughs> Mrs Derwent said that Sir Hector Blair told her Lady Agnes's injury was fatal. He did not say so to me. <laughs> what are you saying, man? A broken back is no longer regarded as a fatal injury. With modern surgery, there have been several cases of partial recovery. Oh. Lady Agnes may have lived. Mrs. Derwent was a hospital nurse and would know this. Lady Agnes Derwent was my best friend. If what I say is not true, why has Mrs. Derwent been trying for a year to keep me quiet? These are the letters she has written to me. London, Rome, Basel, Paris. The sums weren't large and so she had to write often. Why did she do it if she wasn't afraid of me? And why did she go upstairs just now to fetch her sapphire necklace because the money had run short? If you don't believe me, ask her what she's got in that box. Yes, yes. These are my letters and these are my jewels. And now which of the two of us are you going to believe? Me, Kate Tredennis, Agnes's friend and your wife? 
Oh, this miserable blackmailer, who boasts of having lived on a helpless woman's fears, and whose persecution did not begin until Sir Hector Blair, the only witness against him, was dead. I ask you, which of us two? Kate. Ah, oh, it must be one or the other, you know. If you believe this man, I leave your house on the instant. Dr. Carruthers, leave immediately. There's no need. To now. we may have time to say two words to each other at last. What a crazy idea to celebrate one's wedding anniversary by filling up the house with people. Kate seems to have grown quite mad about society. I believe she hates to be alone. Alone with Derwent? After two years? No. Well, Clodagh, I can promise you, I hope, we shan't have this kind of an anniversary. Do you think there's something wrong? They're perfectly devoted to one another. Of course, John has his work. And on Sundays when he's free, she... Fills the house with people. That does seem. But let's talk bit... about ourselves. And what's the use of being engaged to a girl when you're never alone with her long enough to tell her how much you. There you are. <laughs> oh, um. You must be hot. Let me give you some iced tea. Will you join Lady Asking Me? If we must. I mean, we must. <laughs> Delighted. <laughs> the heat is very tiring. Tired? A bit of it. There's nothing I enjoy so much as going out with my husband. It positively refreshes me to see him boring other people. <laughs> Who's he boring now, Aunt Susan? Oh, poor little Mrs. Lingard, as usual. He's out in a punt reciting poetry to her, poor dear. She does it for her husband's career. I believe she dislikes them both equally. <laughs> but where's your husband, my dear? I haven't seen him since luncheon. Such an elusive character he's become. He's driving down to the station to fetch Lord Ossley. They ought to be here in a few moments. Let's stroll to the gate and meet them. I'm tired of drinking tea, if nothing else. Excuse us. Excuse us. Absolutely. <sighs> Seventeen. What are you talking about? Scoring the number of times we've been interrupted. It is the seventeenth time since luncheon that I've tried to tell you how much I... <laughs> No, my good man, go away. A note oh. for Miss Neville. I'll be five minutes. Wait here. Clodagh, no, wait. We shouldn't discuss it here. Well, Kate is saying goodbye to people and we shan't be interrupted. So? I invited myself to the vicarage, met Kate's family. They were very much pleased by my visit and ventured to ask me to dine. The dinner hour was two, if you can believe that, but I ventured to go. There's nothing I wouldn't do for you, Osterley. Mm. I was never in an atmosphere of more oppressive respectability. They all had on their Sunday clothes, and the dinner was, oh, well, the kind that grace is said over. It never is, you know, over really good food. <laughs> <laughs> they talked a great deal about Kate. Told me all her past history. Didn't seem the least shy of the subject. Nothing to be found there. Yes, but they're her own people. I canvassed the village. Same result. Everyone had a good word for her. She was too Clever. Hadn't enough colour. That was the worst of it. If there is anything, it must have happened after she left home. I think we must drop it. Really? Now, she went to live with Agnes after a year of working in the hospital. Did anything happen there? Nothing. You've inquired? Nothing. Unless there was something while she was at Winterby. At Winterby? Yeah, the other day, it occurred to me... When Mrs. Derwin was talking over this little party the other day and asking me whom she should invite, you know that way she has of always affecting to consider my wishes and follow my advice, 
I happened to suggest her asking Basil Mount. The most natural suggestion, one of Durban's oldest friends, as you know. He was always down at Winterby before Agnes's death. Well? Well, she refused, point blank. Mm. What reason did she give? None. She blushed and stammered, and then pulled herself together and said, of course, anyone I wished was welcome, and the note should go at once. Did it? I don't know. He's not here, as you see. And from her behaviour, you infer... Hang it, they must have had plenty of opportunity of seeing each other at Winterby. And you know, Mount is considered fatal to the women. But in this case, I believe you're mistaken. Why? You agree it's something. Why not that? I don't know. But it's not that. (sighs) It's something else. But what can it be? But it's making John miserable. I can't be deceived. (sighs) You know as well as I do, Susan, that their happiness is too... Too vivid to be genuine. Too expressive. Play acting. But if John knows something and has made up his mind to conceal it, wouldn't you to respect his decision? And leave Agnes's child to grow up under the care of a woman I distrust? No. No, I have my granddaughter's rights to defend. His marriage was an act of madness. A wild impulse of gratitude to the woman who had nursed Agnes... If he's too proud to own his mistake, I shall not stand by to see Sylvia sacrificed and his career ruined by such a false sense of... Uh, um. Yes, yes, ruined. The man has lost all heart, all ambition. His superior has spoken to me about him several times lately. Calm yourself. If I could only get him away for a while, detached from this woman's influence... I suggested something of the sort the other day at the Foreign Office. I spy the happy couple. Kate. Let's make our escape. (laughs) This is the first chance I've had to speak to you all afternoon. Let us stroll down to the river. I thought you'd be glad to see a few of your friends. Was was I wrong asking them? I, I like you to amuse yourself, to have a cheerful house, only... Yes? I haven't had the chance to give you this little trifle that I brought down from the town with me for our anniversary. Oh, how good you are. Oh, pearls. They're they're beautiful. I notice you sometimes wear the sapphires I gave you when we were married. They have painful associations for us both. Will you put them away to please me and wear these instead? You've never believed me, have you? You are cruelly unjust. I'm human, that's all. Has my conduct in the last year shown in any way that It's shown that you're too proud to let anyone know what you're suffering. I'm... I'm sorry I spoke of the sapphires. The pearls are lovely, thank you. Go for your walk to the river. Yes. Yes, I I would. Mrs. Derwent? Oh. I'm looking everywhere for you. May I say a word to you? Yes. Yeah, any word you wish. When Clodagh accepted me, I was the happiest man on earth. The past tense already? She's hiding something from me. Hiding? Clodagh, you're dreaming. She went to meet him not 20 minutes ago. Well, this is madness. I know, because I followed her. She... She told me to wait for her here, and I meant to, I swear. But I saw her going down the road towards the King's Arms. You followed her? Listen, please. At the door of the King's Arms, a man was waiting for her. She talked with him a few minutes and then handed him something. You followed her? I've seen her with the same man before. I saw them in Kensington Gardens one day last month. I'd know the man anywhere. A tall, black, theatrical-looking fellow with a kind of seedy good looks. Mrs. Derwent? What became of the man? Oh, he disappeared in the direction of the station. And Clodagh? She came back, and I saw her go upstairs. She'd been crying. Do you remember one day, last spring, when we were talking about Sir Gerald Willoughby's marriage? Yes, to be be sure I do. It was the first day that Clodagh gave me the least encouragement. Do you remember what you said? That if 
Circumstances were against your wife. You distrust circumstances and not her. There's nothing a man won't say when he's in love. Well, aren't you in love now? No, I'm engaged. Is there such a difference? All the difference between theory and practice. And if I were to tell you that I think I know Clodagh's motive and that, that it, it does her honour, if I were to tell you that the secret is not hers, that what she does is done to shield a friend... Mr. Maseret, if I were to assure you of this, would you be satisfied to ask no more? My dear Mrs. Derwent, if you were to tell me this, I should profess myself satisfied and go home and be perfectly miserable. And on cue, there she is. I, I'm going. I can't see her now. I'm going back to town. No, no, no. Wait, wait. Clodagh! Come here. Clodagh. Whom did you go out to meet just now? I went out alone for a stroll by the river. Y- yes, but someone joined you at the King's Arms. You followed me? Yes. You followed me? I think you owe Mr. Maseret an explanation. I decline to answer. Clodagh. I can't explain. I should not have followed you. No, you should not have. I will explain, then. I can guess with whom you met. And I know for whose sake you did it. Kate, don't. You must not. It was for me, Mr. Maseret. You? You shan't say another word, Kate. You Mr. Maseret has a right to know. But I... I don't know. You don't? I only know that some danger threatens you. You and John. It happened by accident two or three months ago. One day when I was at your house waiting for you to come in, a letter was brought me by mistake. An unaddressed letter. Asking for money? Yes. And you answered it? I saw that something was troubling you. I had guessed it long before. And so I went and met the man and gave him what I could. I knew I could help. What more does one need to know when one's friends are in trouble? Mrs. Dermont, won't you kindly have me kicked out of the house? Clodagh, I do not deserve... You have been heroic, dear. But there must be no more concealment. No more pretending, no more feigning a happiness that hurts. Is the man you saw, Dr. Carruthers? Yes. He found out, no matter how, a secret of mine that I would have given my life to keep from John. I can't tell you what the secret is. I leave you to believe that, if you can, that I'm not ashamed of it. That I kept it from John, not for my sake, but for his and and that of others. A year ago, John found out. I had to tell him. I wish these... These people would leave. John is saying farewell to the last of them. He'll be here in a second. Am I crying? Believe the best you can of me. I can ask that. And in, and in judging me, remember that he knows and that he, uh... What is this, Kate? What has happened? Clodagh? He has been here. Clodagh gave him money. He's spoken to Clodagh? Taken money from her? This shall not happen again. Thank you, Clodagh. Thank you. I've made up my mind to have the man arrested. No, but... This shall not happen again. If there is to be any scandal, we must face it. But, but whatever happens, remember, Clodagh, and you, Maseret, since you are so soon to be one of us, that I am in my wife's confidence and that I approve the course she has taken. Oh, we will, of course, not breathe. Of, of course you won't. Will you at least tell me who the letter is from? Lord Ripton. Where is Derwent? Oh, he'll be here directly. What is the man dilly-dallying for? He should be here. My note said urgent. Oh, there they are. They? Good Lord, he's brought his wife and Sylvia. And Lord Ripton is? You know damn well who he is. John's superior at the Foreign Office. What have you been up to? My lord. Oh, come in, come in. My dears, uh, Lady Usk, will you... I'm quite comfortable. Lady Usk, how do you do? Off you go, my dear. Run along. I'll be back soon. 
Come sit by me, Kate. This is very urgent, Dermot. Lord Ripton has written, Grave matter of national importance. There is no time to be lost. Will you undertake to start for China tomorrow on a special mission? You must catch the P&O boat that sails tomorrow morning. This is very sudden, very. Ripton had said nothing to you? He spoke of the possibility a day or two ago, but I had no idea the summons would come so soon. Ah, then you're not unprepared. I, I haven't spoken to my wife. Mrs. Derwent, your husband has been asked to undertake a mission. I believe this may be a turning point in your husband's career. Such a brilliant opportunity is seldom offered to so young a man. It would be madness to refuse. Well, where is it to? If I go, you do understand that I must go alone. In the present state of things out there, it's quite impossible to take you and Sylvia. It is... To China. China? But that, that would mean you, you'd be... It, it may mean an absence of a year. More, perhaps. I see. And you tell me to go? And I tell you to go. Sylvia should be told of this at once. This is very generous of you, my dear. No, oh, packing, packing. Wilkins can do that. We need not worry about that. You expected this. Lord Ripton had sounded me vaguely not long ago. Well, I'm glad you have what you wish. As Lord Osterley says, it may be the stepping stone to great things. I can hardly afford to refuse it. That is, unless you... I, uh, I'll, I'll fetch Sylvia. I, I will tell her. Sylvia! Quite the right response. Exactly what one would have wished. Oh. It isn't true. I, I'm afraid it is, dear. You're going to leave us? I, I'm like a soldier, you know. I've got to obey orders. But you'll take us with you, Father. Why not? A soldiers' wives and daughters must obey orders too, you know, Sylvia. Our orders are to stay at home and be brave and cheerful until your father comes back. Well, perhaps you may be able to join me later when things are more settled over there. In the meantime, you shall have to take care of Mummy. You're not crying. Oh. You mustn't make it harder for your father to go. I don't mean to. Kate and I are going to be as brave and as cheerful as anything. We will take care of one another. Oh, my dear, dear girl. I must, uh, I must talk to Wilkins. Uh, one word, John. Uh, have you um, made any plans about Sylvia? Will I take the child out into the garden? All this adult talk is very dull. Come along, Sylvia. Yes, but... Right... We will keep on the townhouse, of course, and... Do you intend to leave Sylvia entirely to Mrs. Derwent's care during your absence? I... I hope you will consider her and yours as well, sir. I was about to suggest that you should give me Sylvia. Take her away from Kate? Well, she is nothing to Mrs. Derwent. There is no relationship, I mean. Sylvia is my daughter's child, and I am an old man... She is to be separated from you for two years, perhaps. And it seems to me only fitting that during that time she should be in the care of her mother's family. If I leave her with Kate, as I, of course, intended to do, surely the two of you can share the responsibility. I speak from no ill will to your wife. In, in such a case, I can consider no one but Sylvia. And Sylvia is Agnes's child. It is your duty, it is my duty, to ask ourselves to whom her mother would have wished her entrusted. Uh, I know that Mrs. Derwent was Agnes's friend, but she is a young woman, inexperienced in the ways of the world, unaccustomed to grave responsibilities, with associations, habits, traditions, all as different as possible as those amid which, had Agnes lived, her daughter would have been brought up. Oh, believe me, I'm not saying a word against Mrs. Derwent. I am simply looking at the case as I believe Agnes would have looked at it. 
That is my first duty. But Kate would be willing to go to you for counsel, advice... No, impossible, my dear John. A divided responsibility would be intolerable to us and disastrous to Sylvia. A child at her impressionable age should be under one person's control. I'm sure Mrs Derwent would agree to that. You make it very hard for me, sir. How can I decide such a question out of hand? Let Mrs Derwent decide it. Now? You can hardly leave England with your daughter's fate unsettled. Mrs. Derwent, I want your help. Of course. I want you to ask your husband to leave Sylvia with me till his return. (laughs) I beg your pardon? Yes. I am an old man, remember, and she is my daughter's child. Isn't it natural that I should wish to keep her? I plead for her in Agnes's name. I put it to you, Mrs. Derwent, you who may someday have a daughter of your own. Isn't it a mother's instinct to entrust her child to her own flesh and blood? Is this your wish, John? I had no idea that Lord Austin. It depends on you, Mrs. Derwent. Derwent is afraid you may feel hurt, may think yourself slighted. He doesn't dare plead my cause, and so I appeal to you. You wish Sylvia to be entirely under your care. To live with you, in fact. You wish to to separate her from, from me. You are so young, fond of society. Your life is full of interests and amusements. I am old, tired and lonely. There are times when the care of a girl of Sylvia's age might be a burden to you, a restriction, while... To me, it could only be a joy and a consolation. And you propose to relieve me of that burden, Mm. to relieve me completely. I have already pointed out to Derwent how injudicious it is to divide the responsibility in such cases. It can only make the child unhappy. You agree with me in that respect, Mrs. Derwent? Yes. I was sure you would. Your wife is always so reasonable. I have your consent, then. I have nothing to say. My husband must decide. Kate, I I entreat you not to make this more difficult for me. More difficult for you? You must remember that Sylvia is Lord Osterley's granddaughter. And Agnes's child. Well, you have been very generous to me, John, I know that. Excuse me for a moment. Sylvia, my dear. Mama? Sylvia. (laughs) Do take uh, Lady Usk down into the rose garden and show her the white roses. They are so lovely. Oh, one, uh, one kiss first, if you please. We will be brave. Yes. Yes, we will. Off you go. I have said goodbye to your granddaughter, Lord Osterley. My dear Mrs. Derwent, I I had no idea of of so abrupt... I rather wanted to get it over with. This is not what I intended. You must believe me. I believe you. Of course I believe you. Yes, uh, the walking keeps me warm. Mm. <clears throat> Two letters for you. Here. Thank you, Mrs. Fullerton. A case at last, perhaps, or a position? Who knows? Lack of satisfactory references. Regret that there is no opening at present. Any responsible person who could vouch for you. (sighs) Same old story. 
Dearest Mummy, Cloda has promised to send you this letter, and so I write to tell you how I miss you. Oh, I can't bear that. The first letter I can bear, but not that. Who is it? It's taken me nearly a year and cost me a perfect fortune to find you. Uh, what a goose you are. And how this place smells of cabbage. What, what, was it Clodagh who told you? No, indeed. Oh, I wish he had. It would have been infinitely cheaper. Well, I cannot imagine why you should have been at such expense on my account. Oh, it isn't on your account. It's on mine. I did you an injustice and... I've been wanting to apologise for it ever since. An injustice? A woman who has something to hide doesn't creep away without a word from her husband's house and bury herself in the slums. Not she. If there'd been anything wrong, you would simply have remained at home and engaged the best cook in London. Am I not doing so? Has shown me what a fool I am. In spite of, well, some years' experience... To forget it's only a perfectly innocent person who dares to act as if they were guilty. Will you accept my apology? Uh, yes, but I hardly think it was your only reason for coming here today. No, you're quite right. I came to preach as well as to do penance. Do you know this room is horribly cold? Won't you give me a cup of tea? I I'm so sorry, but unfortunately at the moment I... Uh, Mrs. Derwent. You've no business to be freezing and starving yourself like this. I mean, for whose benefit are you doing it? I'm, I'm sure you mean kindly. But you know, though I left my husband's house, it was he who went first. Oh, we all know that there was a misunderstanding of some sort between you, but then do two people ever really understand each other? I'm sure a lot of positive happiness is missed in looking for the superlative. Come home, my dear. Let people see that you're not ashamed to live under your husband's roof. By and by, he'll come back from China and live there with you and things will arrange themselves. No matter what is going on at the back of the house, one can always keep flowers in the front window. Is it so much easier to pretend a happiness than to accept a grief? My dear, after 20, all life is pretending. And it's easier to pretend in a good house with everybody's cards on the hall table than alone in a garret under a false name. Yeah, but there is one thing I don't have to pretend here. What's that? I'd forgotten what my life was like before I was 20. That was my real life. And this is now. You know what the martyrs were? Simply people who refused to forget. <sighs> oh, well. I saw myself in... I will see myself out. Goodbye. You'll get your money, you know. Goodbye, Lady Ask. But how did she find you out? Did my uncle send her? Uh, no, I think not. She merely came to give me some good advice on her own account. Of course, she'll tell him where to find me, but he isn't likely to make use of the information. She wants you to return home. Let me order something else. No, thank you. Oh, you're so thin. More tea. If only you would return home. You remember our compact? I should begin to think it was you who gave my address to Lady Ask. <laughs> you know I wouldn't do that. Haven't you had any work since I saw you? Nothing very important. And that was a month ago. And you assured me then that you were just about to be engaged in a typhoid fever case. Well, so I was, but the patient inconsiderately recovered. And since then, nothing has turned up. You see, it's an exceptionally healthy season. Nobody's dying but the nurses. You've no right to go on in this way. If you won't accept money from John or... or from Lord Osterley... Uh, I know, I know. You might at least let me help you in your work. You know very well that if you would let me recommend you, I could find you a good engagement at I once. I know. Dear, and I'm not ungrateful. But if I were to mention you as a reference, it would at once start inquiries about my past. You would find yourself obliged to reveal my real name, and then people would know that John Derwent's wife is in want. I couldn't remain in his house or accept money from him, but I don't wish to do anything that reflects on his generosity, and it is for that reason that I've chosen to take up my new life under a new name. Just now my funds are... 
A little low, I admit, but I promise that I'll call on you for help whenever I really need it. I wish I could believe you. Excuse me, if we could have more tea, please. And that all, ma'am? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. You've been here quite ten minutes and you haven't said a word about Sylvia. Sylvia as well. You had her letter. I couldn't read it. It hurts too much. If only you'd come back to your own house. Well, live there without her. It was my first night there after she'd gone that decided me. Oh, empty house. The very walls seem to mock me. It's awful. Awful. Live on in the shell of an extinct happiness. You know that John... Do I care for his house and his money and his name? If he won't trust me with his daughter... In that one moment, the truth was revealed to me. For a whole year, he had tried to pretend that he believed in me. He'd even tried to deceive himself into believing. But when it came to leaving Sylvia with me... You must remember that he had Lord Osterley to consider. Would, would that have weighed on him for a moment, if he had trusted me? Even if he was in the wrong, you are punishing him very cruelly. He has written again, begging me to urge you to go back to his house, to appear in the world as his wife. Oh. You must admit that his one endeavour has been to shield you, to put you in the right light with the world. Oh, if only he wasn't so far What away. do I care for your world? I wasn't born into it, I have no claim on it, and I owe it nothing but misery. What is it, after all, this world that you're all so afraid of? An idol that you've carved out of your own prejudices and that you all fall down and worship. A monster that feeds on the blood and brains of the wretched beings who created it. I never could have satisfied your world. I never could have filled my place in it as Agnes did. I never could have observed its conventions as she did. I never could have propitiated and wheedled and petted it as she did. I never could have fawned on it to advance my husband's ambitions and lied to it to make him happy as... as Kate. Uh, more milk, ma'am? Uh, no, thank you. I'm a little out of sorts today. You're unjust because you are unhappy. But you've no right to reject Don's offer unheard. I wish you would read his letters, won't you? Oh, no, Here. no, no, no. But I will pour you tea. I am civilised enough for that. <laughs> I prevailed upon the lodging house keeper to let me in. I beg pardon, Mrs. Derwent, for intruding on your privacy. And I can only suppose you have a special reason for doing so. I have. I should not have forced myself upon you without a sufficient motive. I have come to tell you that your husband has returned. He arrived late last night. He was suddenly recalled by the Foreign Office and came straight through from Hong Kong. He is at my house at present. Uh, pray. Sit down. Your conduct since his departure last year has not unnaturally made him hesitate to intrude on you without permission, and I volunteered to take the liberty instead. He wished me to tell you of his arrival and also of the reason for his recall. He has acquitted himself so successfully in his very delicate and complicated... Was it he who sent you? ...complicated <laughs> negotiations in the East that the government has summoned him home to offer him the Spanish mission. Uh, the, the one Sir Gerald Willoughby was to have had? There was some talk of it being offered to Willoughby last year, I believe, but... His unfortunate marriage, ah, yes. since then no minister has been appointed, but some important diplomatic question has just arisen between the two governments, and it was for this reason that Derwent was recalled. I see. And has he accepted? He, uh, the fact is, his doing so depends on you. On me? Yes. You must, of course, know that you're leaving him, as you did, leaving his house, at least, and disappearing from the world in which your marriage had placed you has not escaped unfavourable comment. Ah. If you had remained under your husband's roof, the world would have assumed that whatever grievance he had against you, he intended to give you the protection of his name and his 
intention would have been respected. But your abrupt departure from his house, your sudden and inexplicable disappearance, your determination to conceal your whereabouts from his family, all this put another aspect on the case. When a woman refuses to explain her situation to society, society is at liberty to infer what it pleases, and it always infers the worst. <laughs> Frankly, Mrs. Derwent, your conduct has given rise to a great deal of unpleasant talk. As much as Sir Gerald Willoughby's marriage? Much more. That was a common enough occurrence. This is a rather unusual one. But the result is virtually the same. Willoughby lost the Spanish legation because he married. Derwent may lose it because he is separated. And I am asked to avert this international calamity by returning to my husband's house. Oh, no, that is not what I was asked to say to you. You know, of course, from Cloder that Derwent has repeatedly urged you to go back to his house, has persistently offered you the protection of his name, which you have as persistently refused. Doubtless you have had good reasons for doing so. A woman does not leave her husband's roof without some grave provocation on his part or some grave fault on hers. Oh. Pray continue. He emulates your discretion. But since your conduct forces him to regard your decision as final, he can only look about for some other way of adjusting this unfortunate difficulty. The only difficulty between us was adjusted by my leaving him. From your standpoint, perhaps, but hardly from his or Sylvia's. <sighs> Why mention her? The daughter must inevitably suffer from any cloud on her father's name. Any cloud? A cloud on John's name? Remember that you bear it. Did John send you here to propose this? He sent me here to... To obtain your views on the subject. He wishes me to divorce him. He would, of course, accord you that advantage. Advantage? Mm. I gave up his name when I left him. I am known here by my mother's name, Marchant. So I understand. And my object in coming here is to propose that you should ask the law to ratify your uh, informal renunciation of your husband's name. A divorce? Certainly, since he might divorce you. Divorce me? A mere hypothesis. As I have said, he accords you all the privileges of the position. You may divorce him. He has no wish to cast any reflection on your character. Provided I cast none on his. Precisely. All he asks is that I shall disappear. Be effaced, wiped out, cease to exist for him. Is that it? Then why doesn't my present course suffice? Who would associate the private nurse, Kate Marchant, with Her Majesty's envoy extraordinary and minister plenipotentiary to the court of Madrid? No one, for the present. But uh, pardon me for suggesting such a possibility to one of your sex. Suppose some day you change your mind. <laughs> Suppose you're weary of your present life and the fancy takes you to reinstate yourself in the little world you affect to despise. Such things have happened, you know. Women who have quarrelled with society at 30 have been glad to make up the quarrel at 40. The first wrinkle sends the penitent to the confessional. I refuse to return to my husband when he asked me to. It is improbable that I shall force myself upon him against his wishes. My dear Mrs. Derwent, I have seen too much of life not to believe in the probability of the improbable. Well, you needn't fear it in this case. Nothing will ever induce me to see my husband again. Then I fail to see why my proposition... A divorce? Never. I decline to put myself in a false light by consenting to a divorce. Will you tell him that, please? One moment, please. Is this your last word? Yes. Then there is no alternative but to say mine. After all, this interview is not an agreeable one to either of us, and it seems a pity to prolong it by beating about the bush... Mrs. Derwent, I am here to ask what you will take to set your husband free. Take? In addition, I mean, to the alimony, which the court will, of course, allow. What do you say to £10,000? I am ready to place that sum at your disposal this evening. John didn't tell you to say that. Uh, he... 
Uh, no, frankly, he didn't. I think he relied on your acceding to his request without an additional inducement. Well, he was mistaken, then. You were both mistaken. Will you go back and tell him so? You refuse? Absolutely. 20,000? Lord Ossley! Mrs. Derwent, you have always regarded me as an enemy, but believe me, what I am about to say is the advice of a friend. Don't refuse Derwent's proposition. Don't do it. After all, the divorce court is better than the police court. Oh, I see. I understand. Carruthers has made use of the letters. I know all. And if I've spared you, stooped to argue with you, persuade you, bribe you quietly out of our lives instead of crushing you at once like the venomous reptile you are. My God! Mrs. Derwent, once more, for Derwent's sake, for Sylvia's, I offer you this way of escape. And I refuse it. You? You refuse? You? My daughter's... Woman, are you blind? Don't you see that you're in my power? And one word from me can destroy you. Lord Ossoli, I swear it was out of pity for Agnes. I swear it. The doctor, uh, Sir Hector, I mean, told me that she could not live. Let us make an end of this, or I don't answer for myself. Your decision... Remains the same. I am innocent, and I refuse to admit myself guilty. Guilty? To whom? Who knows the story but myself and Derwent? The world will think it was some commonplace quarrel that parted you. Oh, the world! Always the world! Don't you see that if I consented, my husband would have the right to think me guilty? Do you believe him so confident of your innocence? No, but he shall see that I am confident of There's it. There is not much value in an innocence that can't be proved. No, none, except to its possessor. It remains with you to retain a possession on which you set such store. What do you mean? That if you accept my proposal, you can continue to think yourself innocent on 800 a year. Whereas if you refuse... If I refuse. Murderess! Oh. After all, I'm... I'm glad you chose me. Lord Ossoli. Well... My carriage is waiting below. In five minutes, I shall be at the police court. Come, come back. A moment, first. More talk? No. A moment. My writing case. Wait. It is in the trunk. Wait. <sighs> hey, look at this. A moment, if you please. Is this your daughter's writing? My daughter? Answer me, please. I... Yes, I believe so, but in this light... I'll, uh, I'll light the lamp. Now, is this your daughter's hand? It, uh... It seems a little illegible. Uh, read it uh, aloud. It uh, appears to be... It must be you that reads it, so that you know the words are hers. Certainly. Kate, I want you to look at, uh, look in the... Uh, the cabinet. The next word is cabinet. Cabinet over there. Will you be good enough to tell me under what circumstances this uh, uh, was addressed to you? A few hours before Lady Agnes's death, she lost the power of speech. Yes. She was still able to move her right hand and arm a little, and she signed me to give her paper and pencil. Will you? Please, please go on. The cabinet over there. The key is here. Yes, Unlock the... The drawer. The, the drawer. Give me the letters quickly. Now, burn them. Mrs. Derwent, I... Uh, do you insist on this? And now, I want you to send word to Basil... Basil Mount, oh, 
God, send word to Basil about this and tell him the agony, agony. Kate, I know the truth. Sir Hector told me before he left. I know it's all up with me. I can't last more than 24 hours and I want you to give me something before John comes. Don't let him see me. If this pain gets worse, I may go out of my head and say something. Oh, for God's sake, save me from that. Save me for Sylvia's sake. John, my father, put me out of this before they come. I'm punished enough as it is, this agony. And the letters, you're sure, all burnt? Tell Basil. Not my daughter and Basil Mount. Oh, pain. Kate, I implore you. We've always been friends. Don't let me go on like this. I can't stand it. Don't let John see me like this. It is not Agnes's writing, this execrable lie. Not... No, give me the paper. Well, what if it isn't anything more than the cheapest of forgeries? Do you suppose I'd hesitate a moment to protect my daughter by... by destroying such a proof as this? Yes. Take it, then. Take it. Your revenge. But you'll bear witness it was not vengeance. No. Not till you drove me to it. No. I've... I've paid with my life, almost. Yes. Derwent, he oh. was waiting down in the carriage. Don't let him in. Uh, Kate. Uh, Kate, I, I should not have waited. I, I'm too late. No, I... no, 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 no. At least not too late to be heard. I have that right still, haven't I? Derwent. No, no, let me speak. Whatever has been said on my behalf, I am here to unsay it. Unsay it? What exactly? I, I, I came home. After my exile, out there under those strange skies, I came home, feeling it would be impossible for us ever to take up life again together. I'd shown you once that I didn't believe in you, and you'd made the only answer a proud woman could make. You had left me. While I was away from you, I saw the inevitableness of it all, clearly enough. But now, since I've been back, I, just, just these few hours even, there's a difference. A difference I can't account for. You seem to steal back on me in every sound and look of the streets. I, I walked past our house this morning and I seem to see you in the window. Wherever I go, I hear your step behind me and I long to turn and hold my arms out and ask you to come back to me. Oh, oh, no, wait, 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 wait. Hear me out. It is no sudden conversion. I, I don't pretend that life together can ever be to us what it was before, that there'll be moments when I believe you and others more, perhaps, when I don't. I, I know well enough there'll be happiness and misery, as in most lives, I suppose, but, but all I ask is that just once more we should take our chance of them together. Don't... Don't tell me it's too late. It's too late. What? The moments when you believed in me would only make the others harder to bear. Kate, okay, please, if listen. If I haven't convinced you yet, nothing will ever convince you. Nothing? Oh, Lord Osley. My word will convince him. I am here to answer for her. Derwent, take back your wife if you can get her. You, Lord Osley. I tell you, I answer for her. Well... But this morning it was you who told yes, me. Yes, but since then... I, it, what? What is it that you're keeping back from me? Isn't my word enough? I solemnly exonerate your wife from all blame in, in the matter of Agnes's death. You... You... know, then? Yes. And the proof? You won't take my word for My it? God, my God, no! Why shouldn't I know the truth as well as you? The truth is there. 
She is the truth. Lord Ossoli, do I understand that you authorise me to use this paper as I see fit? As you see fit. Oh, thank God. Do you think the kind of happiness that could be bought with that would be worth having, Lord Ossoli? What does this mean? Go now. Walk past our house again and and see if I am still in the window. Go and see if I am still there. Or is it just a shadow you see? A poor shadow. Or something more than that. Kate. Go and see. In The Shadow of a Doubt by Edith Wharton, Kate was played by Phoebe Fox, Derwent by Paul Reddy, Lord Osterley, David Horovich, and Lady Usk, Francesca Annis. Dr Carruthers was Don Gillet, Bobby Maseret, Cameron Percival, and Claude Neville, Alexandra Constantinidi. The footman was Lewis Bray, Mrs Fullerton, Emma Handy, and Sylvia... Rosie Ball. The Shadow of a Doubt was adapted for radio by Melissa Murray. The director was Emma Harding. <laughs>